Welcome to the Northwestern University Rotating Resident Curriculum in the Department of Emergency Medicine. This is the ENT and Ophthalmologic Emergencies Lecture. Today we will discuss selected ENT emergencies including epistaxis, otitis externa, dangerous throat infections, and vertigo. We will also discuss selected ophthalmologic emergencies including conjunctivitis, corneal epithelial defects, and glaucoma. We will illustrate these concepts with a case. A 40-year-old man with a history of hypertension presents with nosebleed. He did not hold pressure to stop the bleeding. Let us try to answer the following questions. What is the most likely reason for the nosebleed? How would you tell him to hold pressure? What social history is important to elicit? And what would you do if his blood pressure is 185 over 100? Epistaxis is the number one complaint seen in ENT clinics. It is most commonly seen in the winter when the dry air dehydrates nasal mucosa. Two-thirds of all adults have experienced epistaxis, and 10% of these have sought medical attention. Anticoagulants such as Plavix, Aspirin, and Coumadin have all increased the incidence of epistaxis. Epistaxis is divided into anterior versus posterior based on, the, based on the anatomy, as seen on the next slide. This is a picture of the nasal cavity. Anteriorly, we see the nasal cavity is supplied by the Kieselbach's plexus. In the inferior portion, the superior labial artery and the greater palatine artery supply the nasal cavity. The posterior portion is supplied by the sphenopalatine artery and posterior ethmoid artery, and the roof of the nasal cavity is supplied by the anterior ethmoid artery. The pathophysiology of epistaxis is determined by the anatomy. The number one cause of anterior nosebleeds is the Kieselbach's plexus. The differential diagnosis includes nose picking as the number one cause, followed by rhinitis, sinusitis, intranasal drug use, especially cocaine use, and malignancy. Malignancy is represent, represents about 1% of all non-traumatic nosebleeds. Posterior nosebleeds are most commonly caused by bleeding in the sphenopalatine artery. Posterior nosebleeds can be life-threatening and often require admission to the hospital, pulse oximetry monitoring, and telemetry monitoring. The following is the preferred method of instructing patients on how to hold pressure when they have a nosebleed. First, they should blow out all the clots from their nose before starting. Then they should tilt their head forward and lean forward in the sniffing position so as to optimize their airway opening. Then they should pinch the soft part of the nose between their thumb and index finger. They should spit out blood rather than swallowing it. It is crucial for the patient to hold pressure for at least 20 to 30 minutes as intermittent pressure will not adequately tamponade the bleeding. Therapeutic nasal packing is used when direct pressure or cautery is not adequate. An ENT doctor or the emergency department can both place nasal packs. Antibiotic prophylaxis for toxic shock syndrome and sinusitis is essential. The choices of drug are Bactrim, Keflex, or Augmentin. Pain control with narcotics is essential as nasal packing is exquisitely painful. Anterior packing requires one to three day follow up with an ENT doctor. Anterior packing will stop 95% of anterior nosebleeds. If the bleeding doesn't stop, the contralateral side should be packed. If the bleeding still doesn't stop, then the chances are great that there is a posterior nosebleed. Posterior packing requires admission to the hospital, telemetry, and pulse ox monitoring, as dysrhythmia and hypoxic events are common. There are several controversies that exist in epistaxis control. First, blood pressure control. Epistaxis may cause hypertension and vice versa. There is no evidence in the literature that controlling hypertension reduces the severity of epistaxis. However, when the blood pressure is significantly elevated, it is reasonable to treat patients with their standard home dose of antihypertensive medication. Coagulopathy control also lacks specific data dictating its use. However, use clinical judgment and initiate treatment with vitamin K or FFP where appropriate. Let us continue with the next case. A 40-year-old female complains of a history of ear pain and drainage. There is significant pain on manipulating the pinna on physical exam. An image of the tympanic canal is shown. What is the most likely diagnosis? What are the mo two most common bacteriologic causes? What is the treatment and why do we initiate this treatment? The patient has evidence of otitis externa. The pathophysiology involves overgrowth of normal flora and the loss of the acidic environment normally present in the tympanic canal. Diabetic patients and immune compromised patients are especially at risk. The two most common causes of otitis externa are Pseudomonas aeruginosa and Staphylococcus aureus. General signs seen on physical examination include pain with movement of the pinar tragus, canal edema, and purulent drainage. It is important to remember that the tympanic canal is normal unless there is concomitant otitis media, which is actually a rare event. Treatment of otitis externa involves cleaning the canal. The canal should be irrigated only if the tympanic membrane is visible and intact. A 50-50 mixture of peroxide and saline may be used. 
A Maricel earwick may also be used if the canal is extremely edematous. The other mainstay of treatment involves a topical steroid, acid, and antibiotic drop. A reasonable choice would be ciprofloxacin HC as it has a very low pH, has low allergic potential, has a very potent steroid in hydrocortisone, and has only BID dosing. In general, neomycin preparation should be avoided as their allergic potential is extremely high. Additionally, patients should receive adequate pain control with either NSAID or opioid pain medication. If standard therapy fails for otitis externa, there are several possibilities. First, and most serious, is the possibility of necrotizing otitis externa. This was formerly called malignant otitis externa, but has been named to be called necrotizing. Necrotizing otitis externa occurs in diabetic patients who appear systemically ill. Pseudomonas is far and away the number one cause. The major sequelae of necrotizing otitis externa are cranial neuropathies and skull osteomyelitis. These patients should be admitted for intravenous antibiotics and rapid ENT evaluation. Another possibility for failure of standard therapy is fungal infection of the external ear, also known as otomycosis. In these patients, pruritus will be a greater symptom than pain. These patients should be treated with clotrimazole, which is an antifungal, and merthiolate, which is an antiseptic solution. The third possibility for failure of standard therapy is contact dermatitis, often caused by neomycin preparation. Let us talk now about dangerous oropharyngeal or throat infections. Oropharyngeal infections can spread to cervical fascial spaces. They can involve the mediastinum and great vessels. Airway obstruction is the most serious sequela of these infections. It is important to remember that classic presentations as seen in textbooks are uncommon and usually patients have more indolent cases rather than acute severe presentations. Usually these infections are polymicrobial and anaerobes predominate over aerobes. There are certain antibiotic regimens which tend to work for most infections. These include penicillin plus metronidazole, ampicillin sulbactam, or in the penicillin allergic patient, clindamycin plus an aminoglycoside. So how do we detect a dangerous sore throat? Most patients with ordinary pharyngitis will exhibit fever, sore throat, and odynophagia. How do you differentiate a more serious case from an ordinary strep pharyngitis or viral pharyngitis? Some of the danger signs include drooling, hoarseness or dysphonia, trismus, which is the inability to fully open the mouth, tripod positioning, which is seen when patients lean forward, supporting themselves with their arms, and extend their neck in the sniffing position to maximize airway opening, and strider, which is audible inspiratory breath sounds indicating upper airway obstruction. If the diagnosis cannot be made by physical exam, then lateral neck radiographs may help make the diagnosis. However, they lack sufficient sensitivity to rule out serious pathology. In these cases, CAT scan of the neck with IV contrast is preferred. Let us illustrate these concepts with more cases. A 25-year-old man presents with sore throat and fever for five days. His symptoms initially improved, then got worse. He has odynophagia and has trismus. The picture of his oropharynx is shown. What is the diagnosis? What are the optimal imaging tests? And what is the treatment? On the left side of the image, which is the patient's right peritonsillar area, we see a reddened and large peritonsillar region. The right tonsil is barely visible behind this inflamed area. The uvula appears midline and not significantly enlarged. The left peritonsillar region also does not appear enlarged, and the left tonsil is normal. This represents a classic case of peritonsillar abscess. Peritonsillar abscess is a complication of acute tonsillitis. It is usually seen unilaterally, but bilateral disease can cause airway compromise. It is important to recognize that peritonsillar abscess is a clinical diagnosis. There is no need for CAT scan or x-rays to make this diagnosis unless there is such significant trismus that oropharyngeal examination is inadequate. Treatment of peritonsillar abscess involves needle aspiration, which in some studies is as effective as incision. Antibiotic therapy is continued for 10 days. There is no randomized control data that indicates steroids improves either outcomes or symptoms. The recurrence rate of peritonsillar abscess is reported to be as high as 15%. Needle aspiration of peritonsillar abscess involves, very importantly, keeping the needle tip medial to the medial border of the last molar. This technique avoids the red line indicated in the image, which represents the carotid artery. A standard needle guard can be cut by 1.5 centimeters and replaced on the needle so as to reduce the effective length of the needle when draining the abscess. 
Let us continue with another case. A 55-year-old female with a history of sore throat for three days presents with fever and odynophagia. She has a history of alcoholism and poor dentition. On physical examination, you observe firm, tender swelling of the sublingual and submandibular areas. Her face and neck are shown in the image to the right. This patient has evidence of Ludwig's angina, which is an infection involving the bilateral, submandibular, and sublingual spaces. The classic physical exam finding is brawny induration, which describes firm, tender swelling in the sublingual area without a frank abscess. Phlegmon is probably a better description of this infection. Management for the patients with Ludwig's angina involves intensive care unit for airway monitoring, intravenous antibiotics, and ENT consultation for possible tracheostomy. Based on the diagram, it is easy to see that non-operative airway management, such as endotracheal intubation, would be fraught with complications in these patients. Let us continue with another case. A 55-year-old female presents with a sore throat. She improved initially with some antibiotics that she took from a friend. Now she cannot swallow her saliva. She has dyspnea and exhibits tripod positioning. Her oropharyngeal exam is shown. There is no tonsillar or peritonsillar edema. Her uvula is not enlarged. There is no exudate or significant erythema. This oropharyngeal exam is normal. In the presence of danger symptoms such as tripod positioning, dyspnea, and inability to swallow saliva, it is crucial to use imaging to find the source of pathology when physical examination of the oropharynx is unrevealing. Here we see a picture of the lateral soft tissue of the neck. The lateral soft tissue of the neck x-ray gives us information about the retropharyngeal space which is just anterior to the vertebral bodies and the epiglottis which is on the anterior portion of the neck just superior and deep to the hyoid bone. A normal epiglottis should look like a thin sliver of soft tissue. Review of this particular lateral soft tissue neck x-ray demonstrates an epiglottis that is markedly widened. A review of this slide demonstrates a normal epiglottis as seen on the left image compared with the patient's epiglottis in this case on the right image. As you can see, the normal epiglottis is represented by a thin sliver of soft tissue, whereas the image on the right demonstrates the classic thumbprint sign of epiglottitis. Epiglottitis is seen much more commonly now in older adults rather than children as was classically seen before the advent of the Hib vaccine, which has served to markedly decrease the incidence of pediatric haemophilus infections. The management of epiglottitis involves airway monitoring and IV antibiotics. Immediate operative tracheostomy or intubation may not be necessary, as it used to be, in pediatric cases with a toxic appearance and a tenuous respiratory status. Let us move on to another topic with another case. A 44-year-old man presents with acute onset of spinning sensation. He has nausea and vomiting. Let us try to answer the following questions. What other two major categories of vertigo? What other history do you want to elicit in this patient? What findings do you expect to find on physical examination? And what urgent diagnostic studies are needed to complete his evaluation? The most common causes of peripheral vertigo include benign positional paroxysmal vertigo, vestibular neuronitis, herpes zoster oticus, Meniere's disease, acoustic neuroma, and perilymphatic fistula. The historical findings that indicate more likely that the patient has a peripheral vertigo cause rather than a central one include an acute presentation, extremely severe symptoms, severe nausea and vomiting, and the absence of focal neurologic symptoms or signs. Central vertigo, on the other hand, is most commonly caused by vertebral basilar insufficiency, brainstem or cerebellar ischemia, migraine, or multiple sclerosis. The historical findings that indicate central vertigo include a subacute or chronic course, relatively mild symptoms, minimal nausea or vomiting, a patient that has generally older with a history of cerebrovascular or cardiovascular disease or risk factors, and other neurologic symptoms or focal neurologic deficits. The emergent evaluation of vertigo involves differentiating peripheral vertigo from the more serious central vertigo. We can attempt to accomplish this with the help of the different historical features as mentioned before and the physical examination. Nystagmus is an important examination finding that helps to confirm the presence of true vertigo and differentiate between peripheral and central vertigo. In peripheral vertigo, nystagmus is unidirectional, most often horizontal, and fatigable, which means that fixation on an object eventually extinguishes the nystagmus. The duration of nystagmus in peripheral vertigo tends to be less than one minute, and there may be a latency period of up to 20 seconds before the nystagmus begins. Neurologic examination in peripheral vertigo should demonstrate no abnormalities in cerebellar, strength, sensory, or cranial nerve testing. Hearing, however, may be abnormal in these patients. 
Patients with central vertigo, on the other hand, can have multidirectional nystagmus. It may be in the horizontal, vertical, or even rotary forms and is not fatigable with fixation. Duration is generally greater than one minute and there is no latency period. Neurologic examination may be abnormal in these patients and they may be unable to walk as their cerebellar function may be compromised. Diagnostic testing should include neuroimaging, but the exact type is a matter of debate. In a recent prospective study, 200 patients with dizziness or vertigo who received a head CT were assessed for the presence of acute abnormalities on head CT. The exclusion criteria were headache, altered mental status, trauma, and focal neurologic deficit. No patient included in the study demonstrated an acute abnormality on head CT. There are no specific guidelines on the requirement for a head CT in patients with vertigo. Some physicians use an age cutoff, as in they CT everyone greater than 40 years. Patients suspected of having central vertigo should have an MRI, MRA of the head and neck to fully evaluate the vertebral basal or circulation. The management of central vertigo involves treatment of the specific underlying cause. Management of peripheral vertigo involves treating with vestibular suppressants such as antihistamines, phenothiazines, benzodiazepines, and anticholinergics. An article in Annals of Emergency Medicine in 2000 found that diamond hydronate was more effective than lorazepam in the treatment of acute peripheral vertigo. Steroids may be used in patients who have vestibular neuronitis. Additionally, vestibular exercises may be used to treat positional vertigo. Vestibular exercises involve fixing the eyes on an object and slowly moving the head around. In summary, for ENT emergencies discussed previously, use a combination steroid antibiotic acidic drop for otitis externa management. Watch for the danger symptoms in a sore throat, including drooling, trismus, strider, and tripod positioning. If a patient exhibits danger symptoms with a normal oropharyngeal exam, use advanced imaging for the diagnosis. And distinguish between central and peripheral vertigo clinically and image as needed. We will now shift our focus to discussing certain ophthalmologic emergencies. We will first discuss some basic eye anatomy, review the basic eye exam, and the slit lamp examination. Then we will discuss specific cases including conjunctivitis, corneal epithelial defects, and glaucoma. A cross-sectional and frontal view of the eye is provided here. Reviewing the anatomy here, the cornea is the clear portion of the eye that is anterior to the pupil and the iris. Posterior to the pupil and the iris is the lens which provides the refractory power of the eye. The sclera is the white part of the eye and may become reddened in a variety of pathologic circumstances. There are two types of conjunctiva. First, the palpebral conjunctiva, which lines the eyelid, and second, the bulbar conjunctiva, which lines the globe. Additionally, the limbus is the junction between the cornea and sclera. Normally invisible, the limbus becomes markedly enhanced during periods of iris inflammation. It is important to recognize that the anterior chamber of the eye lies posterior to the cornea and the vitreous chamber of the eye lies posterior to the lens. This basic eye exam should be useful for any non-ophthalmologist. An eye chart visual acuity is very important, but in the absence of an eye chart, gross acuity is also useful. Gross acuity may be assessed by the ability to read, the ability to count fingers, the ability to sense light, or none of these. Pupillary reactivity to light and accommodation and extraocular movements are essential to determine. Conjunctiva should be examined and eyelids should be flipped for the assessment of foreign body. The fundic exam may be extremely difficult in the emergent setting as pupillary constriction and contagiousness may prevent an adequate examination. Intraocular pressures should be obtained if there is any concern for acute angle closure glaucoma. Additionally, the slit lamp examination may be required the slit lamp exam has two parts. The white light is used to assess the anterior chamber and the blue cobalt light with fluorescein dye is used to assess the corneal surface. Here is a picture of a basic slit lamp. The white light is used to assess the anterior chamber. The light source is directed at a 45 degree angle to the patient and a narrow beam is used. The cobalt blue light is used to assess the corneal surface. The eye is first stained with fluorescein dye. The light source is placed directly in front of the patient and a wide beam is used. The differential diagnosis of a red painful eye includes glaucoma, corneal abrasion, foreign body, corneal ulcer, conjunctivitis, iritis, scleritis, and episcleritis. Let us again continue with cases to illustrate these differential diagnoses. A 23-year-old female presents with two-day history of right-sided eye burning, redness, pus, and crusting. 
The eye discharge forms twice per day, according to the patient. She also exhibits low-grade fevers. Notice the extreme scleral and conjunctival injection, or redness, seen in the picture. Also notice the fact that the patient does not have any significant amount of colored discharge. The diagnosis here is viral conjunctivitis. Pus and crusting occur only a few times during the day. Adenovirus is the number one most common cause. Viral conjunctivitis is highly contagious. Treatment involves cold compresses and prophylactic topical antibiotics, as bacterial infection is difficult to distinguish from viral infection early in the course of illness. It is important to note that herpes simplex virus and varicella zoster virus initially present just like adenovirus. A slit lamp examination is required in one to three days in patients with possibility of herpes simplex or varicella zoster infection. Bacterial conjunctivitis is less common than viral, but more serious. It is acute in onset. Streptococcus, Moraxella, Staphylococcus, and Haemophilus are all important causes. The eye discharge reforms several times an hour. Erythromycin ointment may be used, or ciprofloxacin drops or moxifloxacin drops may be used for contact lens wearers to cover pseudomonal infection that occurs in these patients. In the picture, we can see that the scleral injection and conjunctival injection are not nearly as marked as seen in viral conjunctivitis. However, the purulent discharge is far more striking. Hyperacute bacterial conjunctivitis is due to gonococcal infection, which can invade the corneal epithelium and cause blindness. Patients exhibit extreme discharge, chemosis, and eyelid edema. Intravenous and topical antibiotics are required to treat these patients. Allergic conjunctivitis is a very common cause of eye irritation. It causes bilateral conjunctival injection with pruritus. Chemosis is classic. Chemosis refers to the jelly-like appearance of the sclera as seen in the inferior portion in the picture. Usually there is a history of environmental allergies in these patients. Treatment includes topical antihistamines and follow-up is only as needed. Two types of viral conjunctivitis deserve further mention here. Herpes simplex infection is potentially site-threatening. It is difficult to distinguish ordinary viral conjunctivitis from herpes simplex conjunctivitis without the use of a slit lamp. The slit lamp with cobalt blue light and fluorescein stain demonstrates the classic dendritic pattern as shown in the picture. Treatment for herpes simplex conjunctivitis involves topical and systemic antivirals with ophthalmologic consultation. Patients with potential for herpes simplex infection should never be given topical steroids as this may worsen the clinical course. Herpes zoster ophthalmicus is caused by varicella zoster virus of cranial nerve branch V1. Treatment for this includes systemic antivirals and ophthalmologic consultation. The diagnosis is made by the presence of unilateral skin lesions in the distribution of V1. Let us proceed with another case. A 22-year-old female presents with unilateral eye pain, redness, and photophobia. She is a contact lens wearer. There is no eye discharge. Her pupils are constricted and her acuities are normal. The image shows an eye that has been stained with fluorescein dye. The greenish patch in the center of the eye demonstrates the presence of a corneal abrasion. Corneal abrasions are traumatic injuries to the cornea. They are intensely painful as they are innervated richly by the fifth cranial nerve. Preparacane eye drops are used for short-term relief only as long-term use can retard corneal healing. Patients with corneal abrasion should always have their eyelids flipped to assess for the presence of a foreign body. Treatment of corneal abrasions involves antibiotic prophylaxis to prevent bacterial superinfection, aggressive pain control with either oral or topical analgesics with or without the use of cycloplegic agents, which may help to prevent further ciliary spasm. Eye patching has been shown to have no effect on symptom resolution or healing time. Follow-up with an ophthalmologist should be accomplished in one to three days in patients who are still symptomatic or contact lens wearers. Corneal ulcers are more serious than corneal abrasions and can occur as a complicated of an infected corneal abrasion or of bacterial conjunctivitis. Corneal ulcers are demonstrated by the presence of a yellowish spot that is seen with or without fluorescein staining. Pseudomonal infection can occur and invade intact corneal epithelium and cause blindness. Treatment of corneal ulcers involves topical antibiotics and emergent ophthalmologic consultation. Notice in the image the presence of a layering of whitish fluid in the inferior portion of the iris. This is known as a hypopion, which indicates white blood cells present in the anterior chamber, a sign of significant inflammation and infection. Let us proceed to the next case. A 45-year-old man presents with a history of eye pain and redness. 
He has consensual photophobia and ciliary flush. Consensual photophobia is observed when light shone on the unaffected eye causes pain in the affected eye. Ciliary flush is also known as perilimbic injection, where the limbus, which as you may recall is the junction of the sclera and cornea, becomes more red than either one alone. These clinical findings point to the diagnosis of iritis. Iritis is most commonly idiopathic, followed by inflammatory and infectious. Consensual photophobia and ciliary flush are classic. The diagnosis is confirmed by slit lamp examination of the unstained eye. Here we use the white light portion of the slit lamp. The pathologic findings include flare as seen in the top image, which is described as headlight in a fog representing inflammatory cells and proteins. The bottom image indicates cells which are described as dust in a sunbeam and look like floaters. Ophthalmologic consultation is required and management usually includes corticosteroids and cycloplegics. Moving on to the next case, we encounter a 62-year-old female who complains of a right-sided headache. She has nausea and vomiting and blurry vision on the right side. Her past medical history is significant for type 2 diabetes. An image of her cornea is shown. As you can see in the image, the cornea appears indistinct or cloudy. This is an example of acute angle closure glaucoma. Patients usually present with the acute onset of unilateral headache or eye pain. The pupil is fixed and mid-dilated. The cornea appears cloudy due to movement of excess fluid in the anterior chamber causing corneal edema. The shallow anterior chamber prevents adequate aqueous outflow leading to elevated intraocular pressure, corneal edema, and impaired visual acuities. Treatment involves temporizing measures such as pilocarpine, timolol, acetazolamide, and antiemetics, but the definitive management involves emergent surgical iridectomy. In summary, consider all the causes of a red painful eye including abrasion, infection, and iritis. A pen light is enough equipment for most emergent eye conditions. Ophthalmologic follow-up in one to three days for most conditions is standard. An acute headache in a diabetic or elderly person should be assessed for the possibility of glaucoma.